So welcome to this episode three of Chess with Wes. I'm National Master Wesley Falka. I am um, a National Master in the United States Chess Federation, and I'm also a follower of Christ. And this is what this series has been about. It's uh, exploring chess and also seeing it from a spiritual dimension as I see my life uh, as a Christian and I see how that reflects into my chess and what chess also helps me appreciate more about the spiritual life. So in the last lecture, we talked about truth in chess and we just scratched the surface a bit um, as we mentioned how knowing the truth can set you free and knowing the truth can help you play a really good game. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how chess players go about actually discovering the truth of chess position. So let me recap a little bit and just briefly mention what truth in chess means. So remember last time I said, um, let's say white plays pawn up to g4 and black goes pawn to e5. And if white now goes pawn to h f3, then queen to h4 comes with check to the king and that's actually checkmate because the king has no escape and that's a, the shortest checkmate in chess it's called fool's mate and i made the point that the objective truth about this position is that this is a one game it's it's over black has checkmated white so the truth of this position is black has won if i take it a step back and i go here I can still say that the truth of this position is that black is winning with the assumption of course that black finds the best move in that position so the truth of any position is always um, determined by the best move and then I said that that means that if I take this move back I can say that if I play this move that is objectively losing with the assumption of course that black would find that move and deliver checkmate so then I took this back and I said this position is probably uh, a little bit inferior for black, uh, for white, because white has moved on the flanks, whereas um, black has moved in the center. And that's not really a good answer, it's a half answer, and I know that, and that's what I'll be exploring a little more in, in depth in this lecture, as to why we cannot always determine um, the truth of th these sort of positions. So before I do that, um, there are, I want to say that there are two ways that you can discover truth. Like this, this, we discovered this truth by actually looking at the game. But what if you are actually in a game? How do you find the truth in those positions? So that's one way of finding the truth. When you're actually in the, a real game and you are um, playing the game. And the other way of finding the truth is in after the game, in postmortem, in analysis, in your own research, uh, when you study chess games, when you look at chess literature, you watch videos, you watch other masters play. And I'd say that that's most of the time how truth is discovered. It's not actually during the game, but it's after the game or when you're studying chess. And um, when you're in a game, it's you have to rely on what you already know and then you have to do some calculation to figure out, okay, what could the truth of this position be? And that's that's the idea of assessment in chess. How do you assess a certain position? Because if you assess a position wrongly, then you make the wrong moves or you look for the wrong type of moves. If you think your position is good for you, then you're looking for attacking moves, perhaps more aggressive moves. Uh, if, you, if you think your position is bad, then you're looking at more defensive moves, and that's also so true for life. Um, if you fail to correctly assess your life situation, and if you think, I'm doing really well, uh, then you could be taking risks which are actually not good for your life state, but because you thought you were doing really well, you took the risk, and now you find that, oh, I'm actually in a bad position now because I didn't, I didn't know the truth of my position. Um, so how do you, how do chess players go about um, finding truth? Uh, I'm on, I want to show you a short video of the current world champion, and um, I have it pulled up here. And so let me know if, if the audio is not good for you. I'm going to move my um, my own video out of the way and play this. So can you hear this? Unfathomable. 
most of the time I know what to do. Are you, are you able to hear that? Yes. Okay. Uh, so let me rewind and play it again. Unfathomable. Most of the time I know what to do. I don't have to figure it out. <laughs> I don't have to sit there and calculate for 45 minutes, an hour to, to know what the right move. I just usually I can just feel it immediately. If you know immediately, why do you sit there for a half hour? We've been watching you for a week and you're sitting there until we're watching the paint dry. Well, because I have to, you know, verify my opinion, see that I haven't missed anything. But a lot of the time it's fairly useless because I know what I'm going to do and then I sit there for for a long time and I, I do what I, uh, I immediately wanted to do. He's called the Mozart of chess. And so you got what he said, that he knows when he sees a position, he already knows, he can feel it sort of, that yes, this is the right move, but then he actually has to calculate real variations and confirm that yes, my, my sense or my assessment of the position is actually what I thought it was. And, and this is actually quite true for not even world champions, just ordinary masters like me. And if you don't believe me, I can show you one of my own videos um, where I, I did the exact same thing. So look at this position. This is, I'm, I'm having black here. And um, this is one of my live streams where I was doing commentary as I'm playing the game. So watch this. Potatoes, fantastic. Looks like, um, what the hell is that? So as soon as he played that move, Bishop here, you, you can see my reaction. Like I knew instantly that was not the right move. Oof, that's a pathetic move. Bishop a3, are you kidding me? That's sad. And later on I analyzed this position with the computer and I, and I found that my assessment was right. But this is, this reminds me of a spiritual principle, which I'm going to share with you. Um, it goes like this. It says, this is from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, which says, Solid food is for the mature whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good and evil. Now, in, in the context of Hebrews, it was talking about doctrine, good and evil doctrine, but I think that, that the point is made that you need a lot of practice, you need to have a lot of life experience to be able to distinguish, have a sense of what is good and uh, what is what is evil. And um, that's how we, I see that so, I find that to be so true in chess, that the more you know, the more you have a feel for the position, and the better you're able to judge between good and evil positions or good and evil choices in, in chess. All right, okay. So I showed you that. Okay, so when I was preparing this lecture, um, this was probably one of the most more difficult ones to prepare for because I was like, what am I going to say about discovering truth? So I, I had to ask myself, like, when I think about discovering truth as, as a Christian man, where do I turn to? And I thought of three ways I, that I find spiritual truth in my own life. And the first way that I know of is to simply ask God. Because it's, it's, a, spiritual, it's a spiritual life, so you just ask God. Uh, and, and there's a quote here from Jesus where he says how God has hidden things from the from the wise and the learned and revealed them to infants uh, because God gives grace to the humble and but he detests the proud and so if you if you are humble before the Lord if you ask God in humility God can just reveal things to you and I know one of the female doctors of the church I don't remember who exactly, but I know that she did not receive any formal theological training and she just received all of her theology just praying on her knees. But now we have theologians and priests and bishops studying her, her works um, in seminary. So that's, that's one way of knowing the truth is just, you know, be humble before God and ask him. But 
I've also found that God doesn't always reveal the truth because it says in Proverbs that the glory of God is to conceal things and the glory of kings is to search things out. So God wants us to have some excitement, some adventure to um, actually go about searching truth and he's not always going to reveal the truth to us directly. He wants us to have that adventure. It's kind of like, um, like I, I myself make a lot of um, riddles and puzzles and uh, when I propose a riddle I don't like to give the answer directly. I mean I want my audience to have the pleasure of um, solving the riddle by themselves. Maybe I can occasionally give them a hint but I want them to have that joy of finding the answer uh, themselves. So I think that God also has a similar uh, idea in mind when he conceals things and wants us to go about searching them out. And so you may say, what has this got to anything to do with chess? And, and I, amusingly, I, I found that this has a lot to do with chess. And uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So let me pull my chess board here. And I can probably get rid of this. I'll pull up a game that I want to show you. Character score off. And uh, Michiana. I need to get out of the way here. Okay. This is this game was played between uh, Gary Kasparov and Vishyanan in '96. Gary Kasparov at that time was the world champion. Vishyanan was probably number two or number three in the world at that time. And I'm gonna skip through the opening phase of this game. It was a Sicilian defense and they shuffled their pieces around both sides trying to get something going and they got into this critical position here yes this one and here Kasparov went into a huge think and he was not able to assess the position. He didn't know the truth of this position. So he was trying to calculate hard lines, like what happens if I go here? What happens if I go here? And uh, what happens if I go here, attack this knight? Then don't, don't I have opportunities like queen here and then take this guy? So he, he, was, he was in the zoo of chess variations. And ultimately, he failed to find the best sequence of moves that would have won him this game and he played uh, bishop here which allowed Anand to play uh, some really good accurate moves and equalize and draw the game and after the game he he turned to one of his friends and he said I couldn't have won it could I and um, the, the the joke was not the joke but the the paradox was that he wasn't really asking the friend he was asking the friend who had a computer. He had a chess engine, so he could use the chess computer while the game was on. He could have, he must have been analyzing it to see what the assessment of the position was and what the computer thought. And sure enough, the computer was showing that um, Gary Kasparov was winning. And Gary was like, show me, I saw it, I, I just couldn't find it. And so I'm going to show you what, what he missed. I'm going to start one of my chess engines here. Now, a chess engine is a is, is a computer program that lets you analyze um, chess positions. And I, as, I, as I turn it on, you'll see what I mean. And there, there, there are different chess engines available. I, I use a couple of them for my own purposes. But right now, the best chess engine in, in the world is Stockfish 3, at least the one that's freely available, um, so Stockfish 13. And so let me turn that on. And I gotta be careful here with my uh, CPU usage because I'm just gonna use one CPU. Otherwise, it's just gonna take up everything. And uh, here it's showing, let me expand the number of lines. So what the engine is showing here is the different variations it's looking at. So this, for example, G4 is this move. It's looking at this move. And Bishop D5 is what Gary Kasparov played. That's it's the second best move. And the numbers that you see here are the evaluation of the position. So as you can see here, this one is really high, 2.75. What that means is the engine thinks that if you play this move pawn to g4, it's roughly equivalent to winning two and a half pawns. 
that's its assessment or that's its judgment of the final position when it's calculated all the way to the end so you don't even see how far ahead it's calculated it's going beyond my screen here whereas if you play bishop d5 maybe you can get close to close to one pawn of an advantage and even then you might have to make some more precise moves but g4 is the move that kasparov missed but of course he didn't miss it he he saw g4 but he was not able to calculate it all the way to the end but the interesting variation here went like this queen c8 bishop d5 there was another move that both kasparov and his friend who was using the engine missed and that move was a simpler move rook to c3 in this position which was a simpler way to win but anyway let's not go there bishop d5 knight to h4 so what white's trying to do with this pawn to g4 is get this knight out of the way so let's say he goes here then i can just move the queen here and i'm threatening checkmate on h7 with this rook and queen so this knight is critical to the defense of that square but if i'm attacking this knight then he has to move but where can he move and stop this so you can only move here where it stops this rook so this rook is not participating in the attack on h7 and now Kasparov could have just played rook g1, threatening to push this pawn ahead. Or um, actually, maybe that's not the real point though. But anyway, let's let's go ahead. Pawn to g5, defending this knight. And now take, take and now push. Bishop's attack. Bishop moves back, push even further. Now he cannot take with this pawn because it pins his king. Now I know this is... A little deep analysis but bear with me I'll get to the final point soon King moves take this pawn and probably Garry Kasparov being the world champion that he was and, and the greatest player of all time at that time at least maybe he saw this far I don't know and uh, he probably also saw this because that's pretty forced and he probably stopped here maybe and he was like I can't I can't find anything here but as you can see here, the engine is just screaming for bishop to h6, sacrificing this bishop and attacking this guy. But the point is revealed after takes. Rook comes down here. Chuck, he takes. White makes a second queen. And it's checkmate. So that's what I mean by asking God. It's like um, these engines sometimes, not always, but sometimes they play like God in these in these positions and then it's simply a matter of putting that position in the computer and just asking god like hey reveal the truth to me of this position and then god shows you uh, the truth of the position and in fact it's it's become a huge problem in the chess world because now even your mobile phone is is stronger than the world champion so uh, mobile phones for that reason are banned in serious competitions for example if you are caught with a mobile phone in a tournament then you could be banned from the tournament or you could forfeit the game and so on because you, you could easily go to a restroom and pull up your phone and put that uh, position there and get um, all these uh, variations and analysis there's also um, there's also what are known as end game table bases so if I if I google that here I want, I, want, I want to use Google because I, I, although I have table bases on my my software, I want to show you that it's freely available. So if I say end game table base, um, there's seven piece table bases. There's also six piece. I like this um, for six piece table bases. And um, rook, I remember a certain position. Uh, maybe the rook's here. Like that, three, one, Two and king to g8. And uh, is that right? White to move. Maybe I'm missing something. Let me make sure that my position is correct. Rooks on b2, kings on c2. Okay. And the knight is on b1. And in this position, this move, king to d3, wins in 262 moves. Are you kidding me? I mean, there's there's no way I can understand why that move wins and every other move leads to a draw. It's just that it's like God revealing that to you, saying that is the truth. And of course, if you keep probing that, you'll see that um, White slowly and surely
first he marches his king up and uh, gets closer and closer and even then I, I still don't understand what's happening but you you get the point that some of these positions have been analyzed to the the very end and uh, they have found victories for for white or black or 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 draw all the way to the end so these table bases are right now you get up to six pieces or some, or in some cases you get up to seven pieces so if you have seven pieces on the board then those table bases have worked out all possible combinations and they know exactly what moves work but in chess you don't have just seven pieces you have 32 pieces so if i keep adding pieces for example if i add another piece here it says no information available because and the it's it's not been determined and so yeah, that's kind of like the second point that there's some truths that have not been revealed to you which you have to search and you have to find um, there is an interesting um, piece of data I want to show you related to this why is that that it's it's difficult to find the truth of the positions with more pieces let me show you what I mean by that um, let's look at this so this is the starting position in chess right and uh, if, if I go to the starting position let's let's uh, go here if I go to the starting position there are 20 legal moves so each of these pawns can move two squares so with eight pawns you got 16 moves and then you have the knights who can move two squares out here so 17 18 19 and 20 and black can do the same black can for each of these moves black can play 20 legal moves so if i see this um, table here it shows me that at the first depth now depth is uh, what's called ply in chess which is now in chess uh, as we know a move is a move from both sides so this would just be a half move uh, it would be a move from white but not a move from black so this would still be considered the first move but as far as computer uh, programming goes this is considered depth one and then depth two so it's two ply so that's what's being shown here so as you can see 20 on the first move 20 times 20 is 400 on the second move and then these numbers have been worked out so as you can see the number of possibilities start to just increase exponentially till you get to depth 15 which is how many um, this is billion and this is one billion trillion two trillion billion positions just at depth 15 which is like um, which is this one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen just this much and not much has happened and you have those two trillion billion positions um, so as you can see the numbers are just exploding which is why computers cannot calculate all the way till the end but let's look at something if I turn on my stockfish engine here let me make sure that it's not running elsewhere close that and i'm going to close this what's going on here cancel that okay um if i turn on my stockfish engine and I'm going to, I'm just going to say one CPU for now, okay? And you can see it's already reached depth 22. Wait, what just happened? 24 already? That doesn't make any sense. It's it's only calculating close to 900,000 uh, only 900,000, close to a million positions per second. But then how are you saying that it has reached depth 27 already because didn't we say that um, you have these two trillion billion positions there is a subtle um, 
point that in any given position there's only a few really good moves like for example in this position if black plays pawn to d6 I wouldn't play the move queen to g4 that's just stupid because you lost your queen this means that I don't even need to analyze any position beyond this I just know that this move is wrong and so I wouldn't even consider that and even so computers also realize that and so they are able to cut out a lot of useless moves and so even though this number looks really large in reality is it's significantly smaller and so that's why you're you're able to reach higher depths now there was um, there was a, an interesting article on this subject that I I read a long time ago and there was a there was a joke that uh, an April Fool's joke that someone using a computer had managed to calculate this position all the way to till the end and found that this is a draw but of course that was that was a joke um, but then he then he explained um, as you can see this uh, this is an April Fool's uh, prank but uh, his explanation was quite insightful he said that the uh, chess alpha beta tree which is just a tree of variations with um, those useless moves removed is thought to have at least 10 to the power 45 positions now that's uh, an important observation to make right now with modern tech I think this article came out a few years ago we were only able to reach 10 to the power 18 and that's still quite out of reach uh, I did my own analysis and uh, based on the fact that using my stockfish engine I was able to reach 20 depth 20 in just a second I did my own sort of brief analysis and I said um, I know that in, in the initial position this position I'm gonna get rid of this I know that in this position there's only about there's 12 good moves that I know of. Pawn to e4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe 6, 7. That's also sort of not that good, but okay. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. They're probably okay for white, all of these moves. And then similarly, I said, okay after the first 12 moves there's probably like 10 good responses for each of them so that makes 120 moves for the first two moves or two ply and then probably there's five responses from white side four from black three from white the number of responses goes down as as the game progresses because as you keep going further and further there's usually just one or two or maybe three good moves in the position and maybe the third move is not so optimal uh, so my assessment was that based on what I saw of stockfish that it was able to reach depth 20 within like three three seconds I found that this number makes a lot of sense because if it's doing 1 million positions in um, Is that Yeah, that's that's 3 million. Yeah, if it's doing 1 million positions per second and, and it's and it's getting to depth 20 then this math must be at least somewhat right and when you saw I, I saw it reach depth 27 in about a minute so this also seems right uh, 50 53 um, million positions so that's 10 to the power 7 scroll down to 10 to the power 45 that's here so wow, that's that's quite far away that's move almost 240 which is move 120 and getting here means you got to store these many positions in memory and um, how are you going to have that sort of memory and, and computer hardware because this is like 50 let's say one position is one byte this would mean 53 megabytes this would mean one gigabyte so that's depth 35 and already when you're at depth 40 you're at 10 10 gb of ram and if my computer would go up to my RAM capacity 64 GB you'd get depth 44 but 
I would never get there. So you get you get the idea of why it's not always possible for the engine to to solve chess. So okay, um, that was what I wanted to show you with the um, first point, which is ask God, and sometimes God doesn't always reveal to you. Um, the second thing you got to do uh, when I ask myself what or how do I go about finding spiritual truth. Um, it's just asking others, ask um, wiser people. Because you know, you're not alone in your, in your pursuit of the truth. Others have done it too. And um, the way of a fool is right in his, own, in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. You know, you, for that reason, you ask people who are generally older than you, who have more life experience, you get their advice and see what is it that they have found in their search for the truth. And that's what Hebrews also says, consider uh, your leaders and, and imitate their faith. And so, you know, often it's good to read books um, or the life of saints or um, people who you know have lived out the truth faithfully and to get their insight and what they thought about different things. And that's so true in chess as well. Um, you when you cannot simply ask God or ask um, the computer, you ask others, you see what others have done in a similar position. So let me, let me show you an example. Uh, so I'm going to say a new game here. And so uh, at one time I was looking at this position d4, knight to f6, pawn to e6 here. This is known as the Nimzo Indian defense. Pawn to e3, castle. This, these are all pretty standard opening moves in the Nimza Indian. Bishop d3. And I was looking at this position and I wanted to see what are the different ways in which uh, other masters or grandmasters have played this position. So what I can do to do that is I can go to my um, chess database here, which has... Uh, this is called the big database, which is all the games. Now, I haven't updated this, uh, but it has all the games up to 2014, or at least all important ones. And I can say search. Um, this software, by the way, is, is called Chessbase. It's, it's a really advanced software. And I think that any serious player um, on this planet is probably using this software. Um, so... That's what I use as well. So I copy the board here and I say OK. And then um, it'll search. I hope you're seeing these results here. It'll search through the database since as far back as the games go. And it'll find all the games that have been played. And I can uh, sort them by the result. I can sort them by the year. I can sort them by the rating of the player. So this uh, game, for example, Kramnik versus Kasparov was the highest rated ga game and Kramnik won that game. So I can um, briefly look at it and be like, how did Kramnik go about winning this game? So, okay, I see he castled here, took this pawn. And, and when I do that, then I can always turn on my engine here and see as I see the game, uh, I can always see what the engine thinks of the assessment of the position. So it's not, here it says the position is, is equal. And in fact, it says 0, 0.00 at some time, um, or a minimal advantage to white, but nothing more. So it must be that since Kramnik won this game, it must be that Gary Kasparov made some mistake somewhere. So let's see where that was. And so Bishop goes here, that Bishop comes out there still quite equal rookie one and the evaluation briefly fluctuated but then it came back so the computer still thinks that okay it's it's pretty equal knight to d7 makes sense sensible moves and you see these great players are finding the best moves that the computer is recommending well at least thus far and the evaluation staying at zero because if i if i increase the number of lines you see that some moves are clearly worse um, and if white, for example, plays bishop to f1, that's a bad move, and it's worth um, half a pawn or bad. So queen to b3, again, 
staying in that state of equality. Bishop to e7, bishop takes, knight, knight takes, bishop to e6. Surprisingly, I think Kasparov was shocked by that move because it doesn't look like um, such a move should work in the position. But it's simply, from the computer's perspective, that's the only way of actually keeping white's position equal in the position. So bishop takes pawn. And Kasparov here took that bishop, and which is a pretty obvious move, because why not take a piece? But the computer is showing that that was a slight inaccuracy. And rook to c7 was a better move, because then he would have had to get this bishop back here, let's say, or maybe move this knight there. But let's say he went here, then it's easy to illustrate the point. Take, pawn takes, and now not take this pawn, but bishop d6. And even though white is up a pawn, he has a fractured king side, and his king is out here in the open. So that gives black some counter chances in the position. And it maintains what's known as dynamic equality in the position. So that would have been Kasparov's best chance, but he took this pawn, okay, so takes, king h8 makes sense, takes, and now he takes, okay, takes, and queen takes d4. It's still, it's not terribly bad, but he made, looks like he made a mistake even after this. So white went knight to b5, and now he, what did he do here? I think he took the pawn here. Yeah. Sometimes, because it's calculating so many lines, it, the UI just freezes, so I have to make sure that I, I don't give it so many CPUs. So I'm going to reduce that to maybe 4. And um, as you can see, this move was the decisive mistake, because then Kramnik was able to play rook take c8, and uh, after the trade of rooks, knight d6, and now the threats to the king. This rook is under attack, so he has to move check. King has to move queen to e6. Now he's threatening discovered check and uh, smothered mate. And Gary Kasparov just resigned, and the game was over. But that was just one, two inaccuracies, but, inaccuracies, but the second one was the real mistake, and that was enough to lose the game. So this is what I mean by um, asking others. There are so many other... Um, games in this database I could go through um, by year if I'm interested in seeing how some of the earlier world champions like Capablanca played this position I can scroll through Capablanca's ideas and see okay I see Capablanca is going for um, this pawn here knight to a5 and he's increasing the pressure on that guy so I can I can see the wisdom or the search for truth um, of these other great players and inform myself from what they did in similar positions. That's the second way. What is the third way? The third way of discovering truth is uh, reasoning together. Um, you can reason by yourself but then you know that's sort of like being wise in your own eyes because you never know what you've missed so it's um it's better to even after you have reason to actually talk through your thoughts with someone else and even god says in isaiah saying come now let us reason together uh, and and proverb says iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another and that's also so true in chess that um he, you gotta not just analyze by yourself, but look at the games of others, also play games with others, so you, you're sort of reasoning together with them. Um, so now I'm gonna, on this theme, I'm gonna tell you a story, um, which is, is a really, really nice story, but there's a lot you can learn from this, a lot all of us can learn from this story. So let's uh, go to the chess game that I'm gonna show you. There was a um, there was a chess tournament in the year 1955. It was the uh, Gothenburg Interzonal in Sweden, and uh, there was a player there by the name Paul Karras, who played an an opponent 
name Oscar Pano. So this is Keras, that's Pano. And Keras was from the Soviet Union, Pano was from Argentina. And at that time, this this variation was pretty fashionable, pawn to e4, c5. This was around 12 of, um, around 12 of the interzonal tournament. So take knight f6 here. This is known as the Nidorf defense. Nidorf was actually a friend of Patno. Um, so he was familiar with the ideas there. And Keras played bishop g5, which was and still is a popular line in this uh, knight of variation, pawn to e6. And most players at that time played queen to f3, getting ready to maybe castle this way. But Keras in this game played a move which was rare at that time. He played pawn up to f4. And uh, Pano decided to move the queen to b6, which is a pretty good move, to attacks this pawn, but Keras simply ignored it, saying, you can take this. And if you take, then I'll play rook b1, queen here, then I'll fracture your king side position, and then I'll simply move the bishop out here, get castled, and your king's gonna be not so safe in this in this position. And Pano was probably afraid to go into this uh, this line because he knew Karras was a really good attacking player. So Pano tried to simplify by playing knight to c6, but then that simply allowed Karras to long castle. There was a trade of pieces, but now Karras is in complete control. Black has no real threats or, or uh, counterplay, and white is far superior in his development of the position. His bishop is moved out, his knight is out, his rook is out, this pawn's weak, whereas black's king is still in the center, his, his only piece active is this knight, these two guys are still out of play, and these two rooks are out of play. So white got a really comfortable position here. And now Pano tried a nice little trick where he sacrificed this pawn after he took, he first dropped his knight here, point being that if Karras took here, then he'd give check, King would move back and he would play bishop to e3, attack this rook, and also that bishop. So that was the idea in the position. But Keras, of course, he was a tactician, he saw that. So he simply ignored all that, played knight to e4. And um, now the point was shown with bishop to e7. My phone number would allow me to get it. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to unmute. Okay, I guess someone joined and muted themselves. Thank you. Um, so this bishop now pins this guy or, or this pawn. So this pawn, if he moves, and then the bishop's going to take that. So that was the idea to recapture that pawn like that. But that was not enough in this game. And Karras slowly but surely just piled up the pressure on black's position. And I know I'm skipping through some of the moves here, but... Um, because I'm trying to get to the main point, which is that he was able to just pile up, and you can see all of these pieces are, are tied up with the um, final position being this one, and none of black's pieces can move. His knight can't move, because that would drop this rook. His king has no moves, because all of these white pieces have covered his king squares. This rook cannot move, because the knight would take it, that bishop cannot move because the rook would take this guy. This guy can't move because the knight would take it. So he's only got these pawns, but white can just laugh in his face and just keep moving this and he's out of moves. So Pano saw all that and resigned the game. And this was round 12 of the interzonal tournament and they had still a few more rounds to go. And the, this was, um, at, that, at that time, Argentina was a really strong chess nation. And of course, the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union. It was the uh, strongest chess nation. So the Argentinians were sort of in a panic because this new idea from Paul Keras of playing pawn to f4 had um, destroyed their knight of defense. And um, they didn't know what to do about it. So the Argentinians were furiously looking for different ways to solve this problem and how to refute this idea. And so they came up with one within just 24 hours. They, they analyzed and in round 14, it so happened, it's just pure coincidence that three Soviet players 
all three played white and the three Argentinian players all three played black and this exact same position occurred in all three games so I'm gonna show you in that game um, so in this game this was um, FM Geller from the Soviet Union versus Oscar Pano they got the exact same position and now now Pano showed his idea, or not Pano's idea, but the Argentinian team's idea, which was to play bishop to e7, and now after queen comes to f3, the idea was to play pawn to h6, bishop to h4, and then pawn to g5. Remember we saw this similar idea in the previous game, so they maybe analyzed Pano's previous game and be like, why can't you do that same thing here without trading your queens, and then after he takes, just move the knight back here and now you have the similar situation with this bishop and this bishop and this pawn and now you can just take next move and so sure enough they that was the that was the plan to play pawn to g5 and this exact position occurred on all three of the boards there were so many other players playing but the three soviet players versus the three uh, argentinians all the soviet players playing white and argentinians playing black exact same position and that the the amusing thing is that when such a thing happens, you can actually, you know, be a copycat. You can just look at what your neighbor is doing and just, just look over the shoulder and see, okay, what has he played? So we don't know for sure if this happened because all three Soviet players were really strong players. But um, F.M. Geller was the first to play. So he kind of took it on himself to refute this plan or this idea. And he was a strong tactician himself. And the other guys were also really strong. Paul Karras was one of them. And Boris Spassky would later on go on to become the world champion, was also one of the three uh, white players. So Geller thought for 30 minutes, maybe half hour, yeah. And then he played pawn takes pawn. Sure enough, Oscar Pano played knight back here. And then Geller took this pawn here, sacrificing his knight, attacking the queen, so he has to take. And then he gave a check to the king, forcing the king out in the open. Mm -hmm. But, excuse me for a sec. Obviously, it's not as if the Argentinians hadn't seen this. They saw this. I mean, you know, I make, made the point about um, reasoning together. They had reasoned together and they had analyzed this position and they were like, even though my king's out in the open, my king is still pretty safe. White, in order to attack this king, has to get some of his pieces out, but this guy's in the way. So he has to spend one move moving this guy out of the way. So let's say he moves it here getting ready to castle now if, if i play a stupid move like knight here then white can castle give a check to this king king comes out here and then it's checkmate it's a simple idea so just get this bishop out of the way check to the king and it's going to be mate but the argentinians saw that in their home analysis and they were like aha uh -huh, we're going to move the knight here so now you can castle for sure yeah but then i'll just move my king here and thanks to this knight I'm holding that square so you have no entry there if your queen lands there I'm just gonna take if you take this rook will take and I'm again defending everything so that was the plan and they even probably thought that if let's say so you can see that this knight is the key to this position of black if white what happens if white attacks that knight so instead of castling what if white just hits that knight well then the other knight comes out here so if you take, no problem, I just take with the other knight and it's almost as if you traded your bishop for the knight on b8. If you go back, it's almost like you traded off this guy for that guy. Take and take. And you're still defending f7. And so when this position came on the board, you know, Nidorf was, was one of the Argentinians. He just got up from his chair and he was walking across the tournament hall because he had analyzed everything so he was just letting the Soviets feel the pain of trying to figure out this puzzle and this riddle and of course Paul um, F.M. Geller said fine I'll, I'll take you guys on 
In the meantime, Boris Spassky and Paul Keras had not moved. They were still watching this game and seeing how it goes, just to get an idea of... Uh, in those days, you had a lot of time on your clock to make your moves, probably at two, two hours or two and a half. So they had a lot of time to actually make the moves. So they were probably just, let's see how this game goes and get, get some idea of, you know... It's kind of like um, discovering truth while the game is going on, but in a sort of semi-cheating way because, you know, but no one's going to fault you for that because, hey, it's out in the open. You're allowed to move and you're allowed to see other games uh, when you're playing a tournament. So might as well see the game that's act exactly like your game and get an idea of how it goes. So, you know, I mentioned this idea of um, night here and how that night going there is the key to Black's position. So F.M. Geller being the tactician that he was, sure, he understood that. And so he played a really fantastic move, which was bishop not here, but bishop out here, allowing the bishop to be taken. But of course, if you cannot, you cannot take it immediately because black, white would just castle and then you have a checkmate coming here. So what was the point of that move? We'll see. The Argentinian said, okay, knight to e5, I'll still defend my f7 square. But now Geller showed the point, bishop to g3. Now the point is that this knight is unable to come to the defense of that guy. Because if he comes here, then the bishop would just take him. And now if he knight takes like this, then he has, a, a, he has abandoned the square f7. And now white would castle and deliver checkmate here because the knight's not there to defend. If he takes this bishop like this, then well, your knight's lost, takes castle again, problem. And so here, finally, the Argentinians were stuck. After they did all their home analysis and they were like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna show the Soviets what we have come up with and for Oscar Pano, who lost the first game to Paul Keras, now faces F.M. Geller, who shows him how good he is and finds the refutation over the board with this fantastic move bishop to b5. And then soon after, the other two Soviet players copied this exact move and they also played the same thing on their boards. Um, so in this position, I think Pano just had too much of embarrassment and humiliation and he soon collapsed. Uh, so he decided he cannot move this knight, so he took this pawn, but castles, king came, had to come out in the open. Now Geller took this um, knight, queen gave a check, no problem, takes, check again, defended by this rook, king's out in the open, check again. And now he had to sacrifice his queen to save his king, but then that was soon, um, his king was out in the open, exposed. And now Pano had enough and he just resigned the game. And then Spassky and Keras, after they had got an idea of how their friend Geller went on to destroy this whole um, opening, they found they played a similar um, idea after getting all the experience from their fellow tactician. And so Spassky. went the same route here, bishop b5, and his uh, opponent, uh, Harman Pilnik, who's actually, it, it was his idea to play pawn to g5. Uh, he was one of the three Argentinian players. He ob obviously saw the fate of Oscar Pano, so he was like, I'm not going to play knight to e5 because I saw what happened there. So he played king to g7. And uh, his friend, Miguel Nydorf, also played king to g7. So both games, both remaining games followed this line. Knight came to e g5 now, but then Spassky attacked it anyway. Knight came to g6, so he's like, okay, I'm gonna stop you from coming here. I, I can block this line so you can get here like that. So th that was the idea, but that was not gonna be enough because Spassky took here, takes, and now he just, now he traded off this rook for this one, but it, in effect, he traded off this inactive rook for that active rook like this. Check, take, take. He takes this, but now rook comes down here. So check. So it's it's like that rook 
was traded off for this active defensive rook. And after check, he had to move back. He drops his knight. King comes out here. Now white has one, two pieces. Black has one, two, three. So black is still a piece up. But his king is badly exposed. And Spassky being also being the great player that he was, didn't have much difficulty finding rook f7, knight c6, knight d5. Paul Keres and Miguel Neidorf had the exact same position as well. So we don't know who copied whom or if both players found the same moves um, just because they were so good. <laughs> but this exact same position down to move 22 was on both boards. And again, their opponents had to play rook takes pawn to get some counterplay. And now Spassky played h3 to make a left for his king here. But Paul Keres played h4 to try to get this pawn going all the way. So this on move 23 is finally where they decided, okay, we're going to play on our own now and enough we can we can win this position so i'm just going to show you how spassky went on to win he took this attacked this guy check no problem i just hide here queen comes defends this queen takes with check king goes here now this pawn is pinned by this bishop so check here can take because it's pinned goes back takes with the bishop check goes here now takes this rook and now we find that white has regained his piece bishop for bishop but now he has one, two, three, four, five pawns. Black has only two, plus his king is exposed. And these pawns are just going to march to victory. So after this happened, uh, Harman said enough, and he resigned the game. And the game between Paul Keres and Miguel Nidorf, who was roaming in the tournament hall, ended in a similar fashion after Paul Keres, instead of Spassky's h3, Paul Keres played h4. And takes, takes, and I guess th by this point, Miguel Nidorf had already seen what had happened in Spassky's game in a similar position, except that the pawn was in h3. So he, in this position, he resigned already, saying, I have had enough. And this um, event had a huge impact on the chess world because the Soviets had shown their might in the chess world and they had destroyed the Argentinians and their home preparation, which they had studied at home, they destroyed it over the board. So when you destroy someone's home preparation over the board without knowing anything, that's considered a really strong victory. And so this um, victory had such an impact that no one dared to play this move again. Uh, in serious competition and there's one more one last uh, spiritual principle that we see from this which I want to show you which is um, yes okay it goes like this he who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him so even when you're reasoning together, you could be in a group think where all of you actually think the same thing. So it's like you may think that you are reasoning together, but if no one's there to really question you, you can be in a sort of a bubble and just, you know, um, encourage each other in the same thoughts. But if no one's, they couldn't find the refutation because they were not looking for it. And because they didn't have someone with a different opinion to question them on and press them on their opinion because they stated their case first and they it seemed right to them but then came fm geller and and examined them and found them to be wanting and that's so true in life because you know especially in today's world where you only get to see one side of the argument for any issue and especially in the news media you'll only see generally only see one side of an issue presented and it gives the impression that yes they're right but hey i'm like no one is actually there to question them and to probe them if um what they believe is actually right and that doesn't mean that the one who is questioning is correct and that's i think that's the mistake that um people made they made the assumption and that because the Soviets had won in such fashion that this move must be wrong for that reason.
Ah, but that was the wrong assumption because three years later, there was a young boy who showed up to a tournament and played against a strong player named Svetrozar Gligorich, uh, who was one of the, it was a world class grandmaster. And this guy, 15 year old, was uh, Bobby Fisher, who would go on to become a world champion himself. And Bobby Fisher played pawn to g5. And as you can see in this article, it says Gligorich stares at the lad in amazement because Gligorich was clearly not expecting um, anything like that to ever um, appear on the chessboard again. But no, Bobby Fisher played g5. And so Gligorich was like, what is this kid up to? Like, is he is he nervous? Is he, you know, desperately trying to get something but no fisher had a point pawn takes pawn knight here show you take take check here geller's move bishop to b5 yes but fisher had found rook to h7 there's more than one way to defend this square the knight doesn't need to be here the rook can hold that square and that was a revolutionary idea and fisher suddenly revived interest in this whole variation again because he made you know it's like point counterpoint counterpoint so it's like wait a second you're saying that this move is winning I'm gonna make this move and so what are you gonna do now so it's like arriving at the truth can often take a lot of debate and as long as it's done in the right spirit though the point of a debate is to arrive at the truth the point of the debate is not to convince someone that you're true the point of a debate is to actually learn from one another to arrive at the truth, both of you. And that's so true in chess that, you know, sometimes grandmasters make one move and then the others come and refute that. But then some other grandmasters come and say, wait a second, you didn't consider this move. So this game, Gligorich was not able to find a way, but he at least he didn't lose the game. I'm not going to show you the whole game for the sake of time. But uh, suffice it to say that Fisher got a really comfortable position and the game, um, he actually won a piece and Gligorich was down a piece but he had a couple of extra pawns so Gligorich was on the defensive in this position and Fisher could have pushed on but because of his tournament standing uh, a draw was enough for him to qualify to the next stage so Fisher was like let me play it safe and they both agreed to a draw in this relatively equal position. And then a lot of interest was shown in this line. People began to analyze it because Fisher had now shown this novel idea. And the latest word in the argument on this line is that uh, the way to answer this move g5 is to take, but not take this pawn here, but to simply play a positional move queen to h5 and say to black i'm not gonna give you my piece for free you still have to solve problems for your king and so on and uh, the argument goes sort of like this knight to e5 bishop comes out here attacks this guy and now the bishop's out of the pin so white's also threatening maybe to take this pawn so black has to take and now he immediately attacks this so he has to either take but if he takes here for example then white could take and then he's got a loose pawn on d6, which the rook could come down here and try to hit along with this bishop. So that's not good. So he has to forget about that, keep this knight solidified here and play a move like that. But then white takes this bishop, queen takes, comes back, and the pawn is still weak. And black players have tried to play moves like pawn to h5 and um, get something going. But if I quickly turn my engine on here, you'll find that um, um, the engines for sure think that white is doing really well in this way. That doesn't mean that the game is over, but it does tell you, at least gives you a reasonable idea of the truth of this position. The truth is that if it's not winning, it's at least quite comfortable for white and black is the one who is fighting for um, survival in this position. So yeah, that's what I have for you in this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and um, it's given you some perspective on how chess 
um, how truth is explored in chess. And now I'll, I'll take any questions that uh, you may have. Hey Wesley, that was really good. I have no questions, but very informative. And then I both watched. Great, thanks, thanks for joining, man. I I appreciate it. Oh, I mean you're very knowledgeable. You really are. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Take care, bro. Jason. Anything? I'm trying to think of a good question, but mm. I don't have anything. Okay, it looks like I did my job then. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very good job, Wesley. It was very interesting, and you did a very good job. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't know how many more I can do, but I think that this one... Uh, it, it took me a while to prepare because it's not, not an easy subject to talk about, but... Um, I'm glad that the end product at least was somewhat enjoyable for you guys. So um, thanks for joining and thanks for watching. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, very, very impressive. Thank um, you. And I hope that you keep these on uh, on YouTube or something so that, you know, people even afterwards can... Yeah, I mean, I, I want to keep them on YouTube for as long as YouTube lasts, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Okay, peace, bro. Peace. Bye.